Conversation. My name is Fana Sitomonyane. I'll be chairing this session this afternoon. Welcome again. We are moving and shifting from talking about informal settlements to, uh, to talking about photography. And as we all know, photography is very fascinating. It's something that really punctuates our lives. I can't imagine a life without selfies. Probably some of us today already made so many selfies even before this session uh, uh, today. I remember when uh, my brother took a, a picture of me the first time when I was a tiny little boy in Swaziland. Um, it was of course uh, black and white. And um, it was a non-brand camera. And I looked at this thing, a card, um, I could hardly recognize myself, but uh, I was so, so proud of it. So photography is really something that fascinates us to this day. And uh, as I said, selfies are such um, a fascinating thing um, as we can record. Of course, in time, I recogni I've recognized that photography is not just something for fun. It is serious business. It is a profession. And it is something that is used in various sections of our lives, in, a, in, in economics, in politics, in religion, and so on and so forth. If you look around the world, look at the news, you can see that many of the contestations are actually around photography. And um, photography is fascinating and very uh, uh, important because when you take a picture, a picture is selective. It is your own pick. But the significance of it is that it's a visual language. It's a way of seeing. And to use uh, Jono's uh, statement, he said, it's a language in time, or language of time, I like that. So it's one's view, it's one's take. But you can always, which you can always share, but also you can challenge. It's a way of storytelling. You tell stories. You tell a story or many stories. In a, photo, in a photograph, you can see a story, but also you can see many, many stories. It has got signs, signia, signatures, and signifiers. It gives us mementos. You look at a picture. It reminds you of something else. Think of the June 16 picture and what comes into your mind just when you see that visual. It provides evidence. And I think that's the reason why Donald Trump is often in trouble, isn't it? 
because he says things and then he forgets and then the evidence is brought back and then he starts, you know, uh, taking turns, twists and turns. So, uh, as evidence, it is actually, can actually be a matrix of analysis. It reflects on events in time. Pictures, photography, photographs are contested and they stimulate contestation. And most importantly, pictures are taken in context. You know, um, they've got meaning in time. With those few remarks, we're going to, uh, um, I was intending to take less than five minutes, which it is. We're going to have our speaker today, John Miller, who's a photographer and a filmmaker specializing in documentary projects. He is based in Cape Town, South Africa, has extensive, extensive networks and knowledge of contemporary African and world issues. He focuses on urban, cultural, and social issues facing humanity in a fast-changing world. He has received worldwide acclaim for his Unequal Sins uh, uh, work, uh, which is an aerial exploration of inequality. Some of the students, the first time I saw that picture, it was in a cover page of an essay, I said, how stunning, I wonder where it came from, and then later on at the cover, it's actually his work. So he's going to be talking today for about 20 to 30 minutes. Thereafter, we have Professor Marie Hutsamaya, who will be the a respondent, and she will take about 10 minutes to talk. I want to take this opportunity to now welcome Johnny Muller. Please join me in doing it. Thank Marie, and I'll tell you why I'm here. It's basically all because of Marie sending me an email, but I'll go into that just now. Uh, my friends from Quasi and all the other organizations that are here, Margo and Sarah, thanks for bringing me. It's really an honor to be here with all you intellectuals and academics. Um, it's a cool space to talk about this. I feel humbled <laughs> here in the School of Architecture discussing spatial justice from the lens of my photography with the academics and the practitioners and the politicians to some extent who are implementing policies. Um, it's a little bit scary, but I'm uh, hoping that we're going to have a really cool conversation as well, where all of you, I'm hoping, will participate. Um, let's start with this. <clears throat> so the first photo I ever took was three years ago, in 2016. Um, and I was a photographer. We didn't have many likes. Social media, of course, we all know, is amazing. I didn't take any selfies this morning, funny, I'm sorry, but I'm sure someone else did. Um, but I do share a lot on social media, and I only had 200 likes at the time. So to get from there to the cover of Time Magazine in three years was, uh, it's just been an amazing journey for me personally. Um, but this photo has also received a lot of criticism. I'm sure you guys have your own thoughts of this photo. This is from Johannesburg. It's a suburb called Primrose on the left and Macaus on the right. It's in Germiston. You guys know this area a lot better than I do. We live here. Um, the image is not photoshopped at all, so that was one criticism that I could very e easily dispel. Um, but the more substantive issues that were raised on, online and uh, on my Facebook page and on the Time Instagram page and everything like that, which I'm sure we'll get into some of them, um, are valid. And uh, I'm here today as a person who's humble and willing to learn from you as well. Um, this is an evolving process as a photographer, as Fani rightly said. Um, photography is an interesting genre, right? Because it's not like art, where you express yourself with a creative means that might be more interpretive. At least the kind of photography that I do, it's, it's a representation of reality to some extent. But it's bounded. It's bounded with a 16 by 9 or a 4 by 3 aspect ratio frame, right? And so, like, the idea that this is kind of reality but kind of my vision is at the core, to some extent, of how I'm coming across as an artist. But that doesn't always jive with how people respond to the art itself. 
So these are some of the talking points, and Marie brought up a lot of these points in her email, which is why I put this down, and I'd love for us to talk about them later. But some of the things that I'd like for you guys to also comment upon, because these aren't questions that have easy answers, is photography and the photographer. Because I think those are interrelated in a way that perhaps maybe you didn't expect, maybe you do expect, but it's a little different than some other art forms. So for example, this photo, right? This photo of Primrose in Johannesburg, what is it? I'm oftentimes put in a box with journalists, and I've always kind of had an uneasy um, relationship with that title, just because of the fact that journalists see the world unambiguously as it is, right? That's the point of journalism, is to be unbiased and to present a view of the world. Obviously, it's going through someone's either pen, eyes, or photo, or photo lens, but it's supposed to be unbiased and it's not supposed to have any interpretive qualities beyond what is written as a caption. But this photo, and Time is a good example of one of the leads, world's leading editorials, um, printed it. So what does that mean? Does this mean that this is now journalism, or as I intended it, is it something more? Is it something like a provoking art piece that gets people talking? Because, and that might seem like a small technicality that doesn't really matter, but it's actually vastly different as to what sort of uh, doors open for me and what sort of doors close for me and how audiences respond to the work themselves. Taking it more or less personally, taking it more or less as something that's worthy of criticism. Does that all make sense? Yeah. I don't speak about this very much, so I'm really excited to talk with you guys about this too, because a lot of people aren't receptive to talking about these sort of deep issues, so I'm really excited to be talking about this. What's the purpose of photography in the first point? So I can give you an example of the purpose of photography from the point of view of the first time I took a photo, which is to provoke a conversation on inequality. But that purpose has evolved slightly as unequal scenes, as well as a brand has turned into something bigger. And I'm, I, I wouldn't say I'm uh, completely transparent in every venue, but I'm not shy about the fact that I'm also self-employed. And so this is also my business, to some extent. So now we're getting into the cross-section of business, journalism, arts, activism. And honestly, it's kind of up to the interpreter as well. It's up to you guys what you make of it. It's not all about me either. But these are the sort of issues I'm going through. What's the difference between the single image, the curated photo series, right? So this image versus all the images on my website, versus the photo project, which involves me writing about it, some data, the interviews that I do, this, what I'm doing right now, the curated photo exhibition, where they're actually printed out, and I'm working with curators to actually put them on walls and invite people to look at them and talk about them, and then other uses, like editorial use, or CNN putting my photo onto an article and writing copy that I don't agree with, right? So the architecture of apartheid still exists, or, something, or whatever the CNN article was. I was talking with um, someone earlier, John Arnold, about the race issue in my images, which I think since we're in the South African context and this image in particular in Johannesburg, maybe it makes more sense, but maybe it doesn't make so much sense based on this particular image of Primrose and Cows. And maybe it doesn't make any sense at all in a place like India. So that's something also that I think um, you know, is an entry point into the conversation. Photography is interesting in a technical point of view in that, like uh, Fanny said, it's a brief moment in time. This is one 250th of a second at a particular position above the Earth, and it can never be changed. So I can never erase or change this image ever again. That's the point that the photo was taken, and that's what it's always going to be like. So um, how do photographs spread? That's really important. So there's ethics involved in photoshopping and changing an image, but there's also the transmission as all of you are receiving the image. I'm assuming most of you have seen this image on your phone or the internet, right? Not actually the printed magazine. And this is one of the only cases where my images have been printed in like a mass periodical. So Instagram, Facebook, my website, that I, I to some extent have gone through a process of crafting these images so that they will spread more easily online as well. And I'm, I'm very transparent about doing that as well. And that was directly influenced by Sarah Lane, who's the director of photography for National Geographic. She said, you've got a style here looking straight down that's different than anyone else doing this, but I've already seen the images that are looking more towards the horizon. 
that makes sense. You put a drone up and I like look towards the horizon with my camera, like an airplane. She says, we're already doing that. National Geographic isn't interested, and I don't think you're saying anything interesting. She's like looking straight down like this. A, it helps it spread from sort of a neural processing point of view. It's very um, dynamic on a small screen. And it says something more profound than some of the other ways to look at the issue. So there's also the craft of that that comes into how, how the photographs spread. Uh, we've already kind of talked about the, the business of photography, but what expectation is there of a public photograph to tell the truth? I get this all the time. I'm sure we're gonna get into this a lot because I see some of you shaking your heads when I bring up this image in particular. Like, what is the truth? So I'm really happy to delve into that. Um, but getting to the photographer, and this isn't a self-aggrandizing experiment where then I get to talk about myself, even though I don't mind talking about myself. I don't want to talk about myself at the expense of just doing it for the sake of nothing. Because I believe that photography as art, and this is different than journalism, and I've listened to a lot of podcasts lately with photojournalists in like wartime, and they have a completely different mindset to what they're doing than what I do. Completely different. So my intent and my background and my positionality I think really matters in these photos. And very, I very rarely get asked about it, which I kind of think is strange too. Um, because is photo different than other forms of storytelling and different forms of artistic expression? I don't think as much as people think, right? Like you would never question Vincent Van Gogh's personal state when he's painting the starry nights, right? He's obviously going through some things or when he's got a bandage, a bandage around his ear that he cut off or whatever. Like Vincent Van Gogh is clearly going through some things and he had a very expressive painting style that you would never dissociate with his art, right? But photography is different in what it looks like in the output and the technical parameters, so people don't often make that connection. But I kind of wish they would, so I'm asking you guys to make that connection. Um, how can we take into consideration the evolution of a photography project? Um, is it even possible to have an evolution? Is it even possible to talk about first photos in the series versus other photos that people are doing that are similar versus Google Maps um, versus the photos I take now. And then finally, what's the role of an art activist in providing a solution to the problem? But I want to leave it there. I mean, we'll talk more, but I have been asked by people in this room, so what's, what are you doing? What, what's the solution? Or how can you help me take my solution to the next level? Do you think that that's a fair question to ask a photographer? Or should it be open to discussion? And I don't have the answer. I'm not trying to lead you to an answer. But uh, I do find it interesting that people oftentimes expect things of me that I'm not qualified to give. Um, and they get upset when I then step back. So I've often, I should say often, I've gotten to the point too where I'm able to take some weight off my shoulders as far as what this project means um, to the world or to me, and that doesn't always sit well with people. So I'd be interested in your guys' opinions on that. So those are the questions that I hope we get to. I just want to run through, about 10 minutes in, I just want to run through kind of what the genesis of this project was. Um, you guys can probably hear from my accents, and thank you for the shout out to President Trump. Really appreciate that. <laughs> but I'm, uh, I'm not, not a local. I, well, I've lived here for almost eight years, so I love South Africa, and I applied for permanent residency, which is forthcoming hopefully this year. Um, but I'm from America originally, and this image was always really powerful to me. And so flying into Cape Town, as everyone sees this, the only way to get that image three or four years ago was to fly in one of the helicopters in Cape Town, right? Um, but then all of a sudden, this new technology came along. And I was kind of the struggling photojournalist at the time. So I wasn't, uh, I, I actually never studied photography, I studied political science and anthropology. And I was trying to make a living in South Africa, to be perfectly honest. So I was building my brand, I was doing tourism videos and stuff, and I bought a drone to add value. And the first video I shot, um, and I don't know if this is gonna play with sound was a blue corner on Table Mountain. And I know this is not legal to do. I know this is three years ago now, so give me a little bit. <laughs> it's not like I shot this yesterday. Because um, what I wanted to do, and I'm setting this up because I, I didn't come to the point of view of like, trying to change the world with a drone. I wanted 
wanted to make pretty videos. I just wanted to take videos of my friends hiking on Table Mountain. <clears throat> but this video, when I put it on YouTube, and it's got like nine or 10,000 views on YouTube, which was way more than I ever had before. So my friend Mike, um, who grew up in Cape Town said, wow, I've never seen Table Mountain look like that before. That's crazy. <clears throat> and that was the light bulb moment that went off over my head where I realized I have the power to change people's perspectives on things with a drum. Because everyone knows what Table Mountain looks like. We've got those bumper stickers in Cape Town. Like everyone knows what it is, the three peaks, right? So for him to say I didn't know what it looked like was massive to me. And I think I could have dismissed that, but I was kind of underemployed at the time. Uh, <laughs> I still am, actually. So I, I decided to kind of lean into that. And um, you know, I, there was maps like this in my anthropology course at UCT. And this, is, this was always really interesting to me as, as an American, that the city wasn't organically set up to separate people. We're sitting here in the architecture department, which is awesome, because I often show this in I have to kind of explain. I don't think I have to explain this to you guys at all, right? Like, this was intentional, totally intentional. And to me, I was always interested in like the dividing lines between these three colors. Like, uh, I think Marie, you brought it up earlier, like uh, about the Dolomite area that you were talking about. Like, this is classic apartheid planning, right? These buffer strips, the uh, causeways for like electrical pylons, greenways, highways, super effective ways to separate people, right? And I thought. Okay, why don't I go to um, this area near Nordhoek called Moskvamlede, and I knew that there was one of those divisions right here, and I know that the word township versus informal settlement versus neighborhood are contested, and I don't want to use the wrong one in this room, but let's just say Moskvamlede was a neighborhood that I was interested in because of its very unique position there in that valley, <laughs> and also that the fact that South Africa, um, because of Crime and other factors has a lot of gated communities, and this one was one of them. So I had to park inside this cul de sac to take the photo of my drone. Maybe I could have gone into Mosquito or one of the other neighborhoods, but I didn't. I chose to go into the neighborhood next to it. And I couldn't see over the fence, which means no one that lived there could see over the fence, which means no one that lives there sees the shacks, right? So like, it kind of was falling together, and this is from Google Earth, obviously. So like, I parked here. That might be my oil spot for my old crappy car that I drove there, my BMW 320i. Um, and then, yeah, this is the video that came out of this. So this is from three years ago. <clears throat> Very first footage that I shot. And uh, it blew me away, you know? Like, I'm watching this just in the screen on my phone blew me away. And then, and then I went home, I downloaded the footage, I took the best photo and I put it onto my Facebook page and I went to sleep. And that was the photo. And I woke up in the morning, the next morning, and like my phone was completely blown up. It was like smoking. <laughs> and I was like, this is crazy. Like, I had 200 people that liked my page. Who was, who was the node that shared it, right? I'd love to go back and retro-analyze how the sharing happened. But it, sh it was shared. So you can see some of the comments here. You can see some of the people tagging, 100,000 shares, 199,000. So there's like going crazy. And the comments, and some of them I put here, these are the more like sort of palatable ones, were really scary. And so like, as someone who isn't uh, an activist per se, and someone who doesn't represent the community on either side, really, um, and someone who didn't really kind of have a plan, I immediately was thrust in the middle of this debate. And to be perfectly honest, the saving grace for this whole project was that I wrote in the description, today I'm starting a little project on inequality. And then I described it, right? And everyone in the comments, back and forth, people were criticizing the project, me, other people, but they were also celebrating and they were saying this is awesome. You're making a project. When's the next photo coming out? We want to see more photos. And I was like, oh, okay. Well, I guess I can make more photos now. Okay. So um, I very quickly kind of pulled myself together and went to the next place, which was um, Strand in Cape Town. It's not totally true. The next place was Hau Bay, but for the purpose of the presentation, it's Strand. <laughs> Stay with me. Okay. Suspend your 
And Strand, um, actually, Nozomo here in Rwanda is, was the first uh, area under the group Areas Act, I think, if I get my research right, categorized um, as such in the Western Cape. Someone could call me out on that, but that's the research that I found. And so it's kind of a famous one. And then the buffer strip in between at the time that I was there was filled with new shacks that actually the city of Cape Town had um, set up because the people who were living there had been living alongside the N2, and the city had come in, uh, broken all their shacks down, and reset them up in the middle here in this beautifully organized geometric shape, but with these kind of like fractal things going on here, these pixel pixelated things. It's actually one of my favorite photos, although um, it doesn't, most people don't like it. Because it's looking towards the horizon, right? So National Geographic doesn't like it. <laughs> um, this one, maybe you guys know this one, but this is from Durban, uh, a very famous golfer um, that not a lot of people outside South Africa have heard of, named Papua Sugalem, who um, was famous for beating Gary Player at the 1967 Natal Open and then getting his trophy outside in the pouring rain because he wasn't white, so he couldn't get into the clubhouse. What? So there's a photo of him. Um, so he won. All the golfers were white, and he was Indian. And he won. He was an amazing golfer. And they gave him his trophy outside, and then the rain came in, like a thunderstorm, and everyone ran inside to be dry, but he had to stay outside because he was Indian. So there's a very famous photo of him taking his trophy covered in the boy's wet. Um, so yeah. I encourage you guys to look up his story because this golf course is named after him. Um, Post 94, obviously, they named it after him, but uh, there's an informal settlement that's uh, on the grounds of that golf course. It's kind of a sad irony to that story, I suppose. Um, this one is the one that Fani mentioned. It was a screensaver on my computer from just around the corner here, in Kaya Sands, in Joburg. Um, and at the end of uh, July 2016, I had taken all the photos from South Africa, um, well, most of them. And so, I just want to pause here because this was my very first interview that I ever did. So this one from I hope, from Mail and Guardian, and I was super excited. I'd never given an interview before, and I remember because my house was a little bit loud, I was sitting in my shower, like the water was running. And I was sitting there with the door closed, like trying to like be as professional as possible, and answering her questions in my shower. And she said something that will always stick with me because I think it was really astute that a lot of interviewers have, had, have never asked me since. Is she said, "Do you think people are tired of seeing images of suffering?" <coughs> she was questioning why this had gone viral. She was like, "Do you think people are tired of looking into someone's eyes that's suffering and it's in a shack somewhere?" with dirty water or whatever, right? Like, are we tired of that as humanity? Are we tired of empathy? I'm reading a book right now called Against Empathy. I'm not against empathy, I'm wrong. But I think it's an interesting <coughs> tack that we could explore more as far as a dialogue, as far as what empathy does and what it doesn't do. Does anyone recognize this image, by the way? Yeah. 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 From the 2019 World Press Photo winner, John Moore. This is, um, yeah. Uh, Hispanic girl that had been separated the border, uh, the American border. So clearly empathy isn't dead from the point of view of the world press photo and from the point of view of editorial. But for the purposes of making inequality, I don't know. I just Googled an hour ago inequality on, on my phone. It wasn't my desktop version because I don't have internet in here. But at least on my phone, those are the images that come up for inequality. Are those really serving your purposes when you talk about inequality? <laughs> this is my favorite here. Like, it's really crappy clip art. <laughs> and when you don't see the clip art, it's generally images of poverty. <coughs> so when you type in inequality, you generally get images of poverty. And I think I still, besides the guy in Brazil, who a lot of people, I'm sure, get confused with me because I've been confused with him before, of the slum in Sao Paulo with the, the apartments next to it with the swimming pools. Besides him, there's really not a whole lot of photos that look like that. Um, so to some extent, I think they kind of, in my mind, it kind of function sometimes as like a currency. Maybe Marie can speak to this a little bit more. I've used this term before, and I think it makes sense to me. Like, what is a currency? If I give you a rand, or if I give you a dollar, that's, that's a note that you have trust in that you can exchange to someone else for some other thing of value. So it's like a transferable store of value. That's what a currency is, right? I can give you a rand, you can go to the shop and you can buy something. The shopkeeper knows 
the rent is the same store value for me to him to him, to him or her. Um, the image of inequality to some extent, that one, you can show it to someone and it has the same store of value to some extent that I give to you as you give to someone else. So to some extent, it's really easy whatever you're doing, if you're talking about inequality, if you're in housing, if you're talking about race, if you're talking about uh, post-colonial something or other, if you're talking about, I don't know, climate emergencies that form or whatever you're talking about, whatever genre you're in, that currency is transferable. And I think that's part of the reason it's spread, but I'd love to hear your opinion on that as well. Um, one of the last points I'll make is the Nelson Mandela Foundation also was really in instrumental in how I characterize my, my work um, in my writing on my website. I used to say this was my objective take on inequality, or this was an objective view on inequality. And uh, Vern, the archivist from Nelson Mandela Foundation, um, was really critical of that. He, I spoke to him as an audience, he came up to me afterwards and said, you gotta stop saying that. It's like, this is your subjective view of inequality in your photo project, and it's much stronger when you start depicting it like that. He's like, it actually serves the purposes of what you're trying to do for you to stand up and say bravely that this is a subjective view of inequality that's an art project, not a map that you just took a screenshot from from Google Earth. Okay, briefly, just one or two more minutes. The rest of the world. So this isn't just a South Africa project. I was very lucky and very fortunate to be contacted from a variety of editors from around the world, including Paola at Place, to allow me to go to places like uh, India, this is uh, Mexico City, Mexico City as well, Kenya, and uh, this is actually a video that's really fun cool. to show you this. Look at this crazy train that goes right through the middle of Kibera. So this is like a thoroughfare, like a road. I know there's people walking here, but it's just because the train's here. Like when, they're, when the train's not there, they walk just like it's normal road there. Anyways, I think uh, Kibera is a really fascinating place, and I just love that video. Um, Dar es Salaam, and then my hometown, um, well, my home country is Detroit and Baltimore in America. Um, the last couple things I'll touch on here is scales and nuance. Um, Scales is the word that Marie used. Going in and out is really interesting, especially in, the, in terms of curation, in terms of the images being curated together. It's really interesting sometimes to go in and out from the human to the superhuman view. Um, this, by the way, is a new photo of Lake Michelle. So I've been going back here over the last few years taking new photos of it. And it's really interesting. If you look at the old photo, the old photo stops right here. So there's like five to 600 more shacks now than there were just two years ago. So th these places are also dynamic and changing. It's pretty interesting. Um, and then also kind of what's the boundaries of the project? I do a lot of stuff with maps and historical work and I, I write as well. So like is unequal scenes all of that or is it none of it or does it matter? Um, and then finally, yeah. Photography has the power to intervene in your life in a different way. And I think that this is important to a room full of academics because sometimes, and I'm not saying this is you, I'm just saying I've heard this before, what's the point of photography? Let's just look at the data. Let's just take the graph, we all know how it works, and let's make decisions off of that. But I just want to press upon you, and this is also self-serving because then I'm employed as an artist a little bit longer, no, I'm joking. I mean, I'm not joking, so. <laughs> but art also has the power to create an imaginary. And by that I mean it allows you to think and create your own imagination of a place. The imaginary is the is it's kind of the state of mind that you go into when you look at an image versus a graph or words. And that's really important. It's really important to be able to think and to imagine a different world. If we don't have that, then we're never going to get there. We can't just iterate based on data and graphs. And I know that sounds kind of crass and privileged coming from someone who doesn't live in an informal settlement. But I think it's part of the equation. So I guess I'd ask you to sort of keep it up in mind. Um, I'm going to stop there. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, uh, Johnny. Um, I think we've had, uh, you've taken us from Primrose, uh, Germanstein, to Sipumele, Cape Town, 
and to a number of places around the continent, namely Kenya and other, other places to bear at. And that was actually really fascinate, fascinating. Journalists or um, artists, I don't know. Um, but that's subject to uh, people's take. And I think uh, um, the exploration of the relationship between photography and the photographer is very uh, interesting and I think it will provoke a number of conversations. Now we're going to have Professor Marie Husamaya to respond to the presentation. Thanks so much, Kwana, and thanks, Johnny. I'm glad you kept this picture um, on the screen because I'll pick up from um, the conversation that will spark between us after this Times magazine. And from a page, um, and it was really, it was less uh, the photograph itself, but the comments in the media, there was a line, um, South Africa hangs its head in shame. Um, after this image was, was on, the, um, on, the, on the Times magazine. And um, Kristen, and I know the settlement really well, Makawasi, having been there many times. And in fact, we the kind of, the, so it is an interesting juxtaposition. And the reality is that actually that in was building is a clinic that was built in the past few years for people of Makawasi. And the way kind of you don't know that, if you see this image, you know, it looks like, that looks like part of that. <laughs> and, and this, this swimming pool, I've only ever seen kids from my pool scene there, you know, it's sort of, so that the road is perhaps less of a divide than an integrator. And there's been many attempts at bulldozing these settlements, that's also the only reason I got involved back in 2007. Um, and the fact that they're there is actually something that's worth celebrating. Um, it would be even worse if they had been relocated 40 k's away to Sakani. So there was this, there was this, all of this was uh, triggered when I saw this image and saw the reaction with the fear that the South African government would, would be enticed into yet another eradication drive because they're so embarrassed that, that it's like this. And, and having the image juxtaposing it like that might, might make it. Um, but but we, had a, we had a lovely um, email exchange in which I got to understand um, and, and reflect myself more on the, on the power of this kind of image. And, and so yes, it is about how it gets read. And as you say, people respond to it very differently and that's part of the power of the image is to, to get those responses and get those conversations going. Um, it should never end just with South Africa hanging its head, you know, that should be the starting point of a conversation. And that's why I really like the fact that you write about your work as well. It's not just, it's not just an image. Um, but there are, for me, there's, there's, so it is about inequality, and it's about how we represent inequality and how, how we read an image like this. And the one way of reading it is that this is unfair, that this is an injustice, um, and the spatiality of this is unjust. It shouldn't be like this. People shouldn't have so little and so much over there. Um, but when we step back, into the South African context where this image was not even possible. And if you had those, I'm glad you showed those images of, of the buffer strips, you know, where all of this was hidden to the middle class and to the white eye, behind a ridge, behind something, somewhere far away, and you couldn't actually even produce an image like this because they existed but they were far apart. To this becoming actually the post-apartheid image of, of, of continued inequality, the fact that we haven't overcome inequality, but now there is this juxtaposition. And to me, it, so your, what your work um, triggers in me is how do we how do we think about juxtaposition of rich and poor? So as planners, we can't change the economic um, reality of inequality. We face with a with the manifestation of that in the way people live. Um, to me, what this image shows is a courage, a courage of households to hold on, to create themselves this juxtaposition, to hold on to a space that is actually quite imbued with facilities, the pool, 
Moon was there before the settlement. Um, it's close to Jamison downtown and so on. And the fact that they have managed that to keep that foothold um, is, is what I read out of an image like this. Um, and so yes, South Africa is becoming more like Brazil. And, and that amazing image, I'd love to have that person in the room one day who took that image um, of, of this sort of apartment living with a swimming pool on each floor and right next to it, um, a slum. But, um, and that's been, a, that's been the case in Brazil for a long time. In South Africa, it's, it's only the last 20 years that we've seen this. And to me, um, it's also a way of reading it as um, a foothold in a crack. So the apartheid city was really cemented um, and informal settlements are managing here and there against all odds to insert themselves into cracks and to gradually open up the cracks. And, and I would like to sort of see this kind of imagery as part of that process of also opening up cracks and, and in that way, you know, it is a, it is a Lefebvian way of looking at a, a difference, spatial difference in the built environment. Difference not produced by the, by the state, but actually produced from below. Um, unwanted difference, this is unwanted difference, you know. Because any metropolitan municipality doesn't like this at all, and is still hoping this can go away, you know, but um, it's, it's, it's there. And so I think, I think the, um, I think your, your imagery needs to show us these spaces um, and, and, and more of them. And I think, and I'm so glad that the, the first thing I said um, in our conversation as well is, oh, well, have you seen um, Sawawa? You, you've done, you've done Kaisen, but just up the road from Sawawa, and you look across the river and there's a uh, silk, uh, uh, what is it called? Um, Cedar Creek Estate with enormous mansions and uh, the size of one of the plots in Cedar Creek Estate can fit 50 shacks that are across the road in, in Sawawa. And, and the next thing he said, oh, look, I've just done it. Actually, here you are. Here's the image. Um, and I, I, I feel that that image hasn't been seen enough. Um, and, um, but so the other part of the conversation was about the scales. And, and, so, and it was triggered by the Kaya Sands image um, because Nothing will change in that image, and yet something very important is changing, and it links to the previous conversation, and that is that City of Joburg is doing a UISP application for Kaya Sands, which is a breakthrough, you know. And so up till now, there's been relocation plans, and now for the first time, actually that settlement is going to stay, but nothing's going to happen quickly. And so the time, the timeline that we had sort of in the previous session, you know, for many years that settlement will look pretty much the same, but something fundamental will have changed, and that is that they'll have some sense of tenure security, and services will gradually come in, and at some point the shacks can transform into something else. It'll never look like the suburb next door, but hopefully the suburb next door might also transform, you know, because settlements are under pressure to densify and, and diversify and, and so on. So, so I think I'll leave it with that, except to say that, that what you said now also sparked something, I think, that, or should spark something among all of us, and that is representation. And to be more reflective about representation that we, um, all of our work involves representation. We write a paper, we select the part, we write about it. Um, but, but maps represent um, images, photographs, having to tell students because of ethics clearance to be more conscious about the photographs they take. But, but every, all of our work um, involves representation and in that reduction, and from that we are making recommendations. That, that's our business. Um, and, and so I think, I think we all have to learn to be more, more conscious about that. So thank you very much. Yes, I'd like to end there. Thank you very much, uh, Marie. Uh, indeed, the power of images is very, very effective especially when you juxtapose different um, uh, images. Um, this particular <coughs> session speaks directly to the theme of spatial imaginaries indeed. And now we're going to open the session for questions and answers. Okay. Uh, do you say your name or you just speak? Yeah.
Do they say their name? Yes, okay. Yeah. Please say your name and just uh, raise your question. But please, if you can, just keep it much more concise and to the point. Please say. Okay. Um, thanks very much, Jonathan. My name is Kira. And um, yeah, I think you asked me questions about empathy, although I don't want to dismiss it as power. Let me take let me just take sure. two more. Say your name, please. Uh, my name is Hama. Uh, the actual my question or my comment is that there's both Jonathan and Mali. Um, the question of my comment is that the image I bought an unequal scene. So Mali was doing an analysis, and we can say that this is a result of political uh, history. Well, what about in the last three decades about globalization? What about human migration in, in the topic of in the African uh, context, etc.? How does that shape that type of picture beyond the thing of the state saying we delivering or we're not delivering? And how do spaces like that create access and proximity uh, to urban centers? Can I ask a third question, someone? Simon, I just wanted to find out more about the response that you have received so far. I mean, do you ever get people going, oh, is it mostly an angry response from people that may feel vulnerable where you're depicting their own opulence? Or do you get people going, wow, this has really made me rethink um, how I'm not a kind of median, I'm not an average person. Um, and do you feel like there has been any policy change or any kind of um, <coughs> tangible change from, from the, the use of your imagery, whether it's from placement in time or elsewhere? Or responded the same way to Marie, and I um, feel like I need to say that because of the fact that it seems acquisitional that I fly over a neighborhood, take a photo, and then put it into Time Magazine, that I've made a concerted effort, and it's kind of my personal policy, to give the image away for free as broadly as possible, and much more broadly than other professional photographers I know for the purposes of studies for nonprofit use, for presentations, social media, et cetera. I know that Fani mentioned and I've heard people from UCT say, my, my image comes up all the time in classes on like architecture and political science and history, which is great. That's awesome. I'm totally supportive of that. Um, but the bigger names, I mean, uh, and if you really want to get down into the details of like whether or not the World Bank using my images is actually a form of greenwashing or not, let's shelve that just for second, but big international institutions like the World Bank, the IMF, the UN, UNDP put it on the cover of a big report on poverty. The Deputy Minister of Cooperative Government and Traditional Affairs spoke in my exhibition of Anina Gibbs in 2016. Andres, 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 yeah, I think it, I remember actually, now that I say that. Um, so like the government response has been really positive, which they don't have to be, I think, which has kind of surprised me, to be perfectly honest. And that's from local, provincial, and national. Um, so to some extent, uh, the negative comments that I was referring to, and to be perfectly honest, there's not that many. I was trolled on Twitter for a while, and I think it was bots or something. I think I like narrowly scraped the edge of these massive troll farms that were set up to go after people who are talking about social issues, which really scared me because it made me realize that like if you're someone who's a celebrity or putting yourself out there, and I mean, I know it's fun to make fun of celebrities, but when you like, 
have a brushing pass of fame, and you start realizing what life might be like to constantly be attacked for your views, that's scary, because it's automated now. It's not like there's an actual person there, right? But besides that, it's like a lot of typical stuff that you might imagine. That, uh, and I'm not gonna repeat it here, actually. But I think you guys can imagine the racist, uh, ignorant comments that people in this country and a lot of different countries, including my own America, make, and associate their names to. That's the surprising thing. This is all public, public record. And people are very comfortable putting their names to. Um, to answer your question in the back there, <coughs> The latter half of your question again, because I the repetition and empathy. What was the latter half of your question? Okay, cool. Um, sorry, I forgot. I can only keep like one thing in my head at all times. This three question thing throwing me off. Yeah, definitely. I think the more you see an image, the less it affects you. It's habituation. It's like anything in our brains. We get a lower response of dopamine. The more I see this image, the easier this image. What does that then mean for me as a person who wants this image to spread as widely as possible? Like, should I hold it back and not share it as widely as possible? No, it's not an option. So I guess I'll just have to live with the fact that it gets less effective over time. Just like the D-Day images that Robert Kappa shot or whatever, whatever, still have a power, but not as strong as when they first came out. Yeah. And I will say, if, you, and if anyone's a photographer in here, and you go into photography forums, the method that which I grew this photo project is completely the opposite of what everyone in photo forums says you should do, which is never give away your images for free, demand a going rate and stick to it no matter what, and um, constantly call yourself a professional photographer and never question that because then it somehow impinges upon the final image. I didn't do any of those things. I said, look, I'm actually, don't really know what I'm doing, but I've got an idea and it's working, so I'm gonna go with it and I'm gonna evolve. And I also give away this image all the time for free. And don't police it if I do catch someone using it. I mean, I might ask them, like, can you please credit me? But um, we don't live in the world of the 1970s or 80s anymore. If you're a photographer and you want a project to go viral, you have to put it out there on Facebook. You have to put it out for free. And it's a, it's a project that obviously has a social mission as well, so it would be like morally, uh, insulting to my audience to to keep it behind locked doors. So I think it was fascinating about what you just said. Is that I love like you see the time for you to listen about that question there. Mm -hmm. Not because I mean I agree with you. I don't think you need to keep it back. I'm just saying it's it's interesting because we don't know really since it's the first time we're able to share and repeat so many times mm -hmm. what that actually does to a human psychology. So it's one thing to say it diminishes the effect, which probably is correct, but in a way there's a sense of neutrality about that. Mm -hmm. What I'm saying is what we don't know yet is if it starts to change into something else past the diminished aspect. In other words, can we start to see it as aesthetic and beauty, which is more Oh, that's what you mentioned. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I thought you were going to say, and so it crosses into being trite. Well, I think that there's a, you know, a, 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 what do you call it, a risk of that. I think there's a risk of images like this turning into uh, kitsch. And that's something totally different. I haven't actually engaged with that very much in my own head, so I'm not, I don't really want to go into it in front of everyone while I'm being recorded. But I think there is a risk of that. The aesthetics thing is really interesting, though. So I take it as a compliment that you say that, because I approach this as art. And I approach my craft as an artist would approach a canvas. Balance, color, line, all those things go into, I think any photographer, actually, if you're editorial, if you're war, if you're sports, anything. And so I know that it feels uncomfortable to call an image like this beautiful, but it's part of what I tried to do. And I made the link between the art, art and the artist, so it's like impossible not to go there if you're really gonna Oh, and then the last point I think so maybe is more about organization and migration. Uh, I, well, I, um, I was going to say it's, it's a great question that I don't have I don't have answers for, but it, it what it what it showed to me is that these images are really also very very useful educational tools to use in our classes. I mean, to get us a class to debate how this came about and, and, and you know 
and what all the influences are and, and bringing in the, the sort of global side of things, I think is, is, is it, it'll be fantastic and it's wonderful that you have these um, just credit for me. us to use and we just <laughs> we'll Johnny Miller make sure our students Instagram. know who you are. <laughs> yes, yeah. But, but I just wanted to add that, um, you know, you know um, in Brazil, the rich have lived right next to the poor for very long, and I, I worry about the complacency of that. So I think they are no longer moved at all by that, that image that, 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 that um, moves the rest of the world, of these swimming pools and the, and the, the, the shacks. Um, and, and I'm worried about South Africa getting to that point. So, so for now, I think, you know, Primrose maybe isn't such a very high income neighborhood, but those images you have of these gated estates and right next to the shack, it must make people in those gated estates a little bit uncomfortable. And, and you know, but, but it would be interesting, like Kira said, it would be interesting for how long until that is just how it is. If you grew up in South Africa, you're rich, there's a shack next door, that's it. And it ends there, and it, there isn't any, any sharing that happens as a result or anything. We don't know. So, yeah. So to me... Do you not think it's already, we're already there? Oh, maybe. I don't know. I live in a mixed neighborhood. I don't live in, in this kind of setup. So it's a bit... Um, I don't know. Yeah, that would be for, for us to debate. We're already at that it, point, we don't care. I bring that up because I don't, and to speak to you, Simon, I never felt really like there was any outrage. There was never any comments that were outraged by the image. There was a lot of people that commented say, I never knew it looked like this, or like, oh, that's sad, or um, serves them right, or something like that. Some terrible comments. But I never, in America and in Europe, people were outraged. But in South Africa, I didn't get the sense that people were outraged by these images. So I wonder if we're not already there, like Brazil. But please, raise your hands and tell me what you think. Thanks. My name is Abby. Thanks for such an interesting presentation. What struck me when I saw this image on Time magazine was that this is a kind of an image of inequality in close proximity, which is so rare in South African cities compared to inequality over vast distance, which seems to be what affects South African cities the most. So someone in Kailich having to commute to Constantia to work every day. And I, when I was looking at this, I was just wondering, is there any way you think that we can use photography to depict that? Because maps do to an extent, but I think we quite, yeah, not quite as um, artistically or evocatively as this does. Is there a way to use photography to depict that, the inequality of that vast distance? And if that just becomes juxtaposition, then what does it mean to juxtapose two places that aren't connected? Um, I just a quick, a quick comment on, on integration, and I don't know, it's interesting Marie's thing about in Brazil people have been living in this situation for longer, in South Africa we have to some, some extent a the bigger buffer and now a smaller buffer, and I'm just wondering who is integration desirable for and who is it not desirable for, and on what scale, because depending on how you speak about scale, this is, this is integration because poor people and rich people are in the same frame. And if they were, if, if they were sort of half mixed with each other, would it be better and for who? And, and if that dividing line was bigger, what, what would the difference be? I don't know. Interesting. Should be evoked by an image like this because I don't believe 
that shame is an age of change. So he's not going to change if you shame him. Like, uh, instead, you're just going to push him further and further away. And it's more barriers of, of different kinds. So I don't, I don't know if that, if, if, if an image like this actually evokes a change. Um, does an image like this provide a solution? And in my opinion, it doesn't. It just says, okay, this is like this is the situation, and this is how bad it is. But it doesn't say, okay, so what do we where, where to from here? Do you must you build a bridge over this road? Must you take the road away? Must like like what is it? Um, I can't see it from 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 something like this. So yeah, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Just for, um, I'm taking it three at a time, or should I add another two more? Please uh, go ahead and uh, just, do, just two more. And then we'll uh, I would just say that when these photos came out in Cape Town, yeah, it was Jared, sorry. Yeah. It, it, it had a real impact locally, I think, because at the same time as a bunch of other campaigns were happening, talking about special justice. And it came in with this refreshing and shocking image. And I think it really contributed towards a change in the political discourse at the city level. And I think it had a real impact on political life. There's not a politician now who doesn't speak about spatial justice, which is not a word that people were using three or four years ago. And it, it had a direct contribution towards that discussion and opening it up beyond the But in, in our way, this image is really striking reads very easily, but I, we haven't found this view to be as uh, viral or as readable when you shift it a bit further, you know, like when it hasn't got that juxtaposition. So for example, like we've taken these views of a golf course or a, or a bowling green, and we're trying to say, why is this space being used by elites? Why is this empty? Why is this being, you know, leased for a thousand rand? But that takes explanation and layers and, and a longer blur, you know, and, and it just doesn't pop in the same way. How you can get those deeper things, you know, maybe some of the readings that you have from there mm -hmm. without. I took those photos. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Gavin hired me to take those photos. Uh, yes, yes, yes. yes. <laughs> yeah, I remember, yeah. Very well, yeah. And we've used them again and again, yeah, but, yeah, yeah. but they haven't. They yeah, haven't yeah, yeah. Yeah. All right, um, question, and then we will hear from the respondent. So, I'm Kristen, I'm actually the one who was pointing at uh, this was one of my case studies for my PhD. So I also know this, um, this really well. And, but I, I also spend my time, I'm divided between here and Canada. And a lot of the images, if not all of them, that you show are um, related around this spatial equality that you're talking about in, in the global south. And, and I'm just curious to know, have you shot Vancouver, for example, which is now the most expensive real estate in the world and has professionals living in campers on the lawn permanently parked on the street and homeless and and yet we're we're not even used to that language there and it's a rapidly as as urbanization occurs it's you know homelessness within small communities and big cities and how that looks from the air and to, to sort of open that point of conversation beyond just you know what a few of us are talking about it but People actually saw images like that. They, the light bulb might actually go on. It yes, this does in fact happen in Canada, and and you know, and so it's, I think it could be an interesting dialogue and a, a blur. Like this is actually far blurred, more blurred than what you're showing. And I think the beauty of that that it, it could be a blurring of sort of the north south because you know we we it's viewed as being very different when in fact. It's becoming more and more the same. Mm -hmm. you want to start to pick up on some? No, I just um, thought that the idea of linking these images to campaigns is really important. And you, um, Johnny spoke about currency earlier, and I was doing something on human rights, reading the human rights literature, and the human rights proponents saying human rights is losing the, its currency, um, and the way to change that is to link it to civil society campaigns. So to give it life, give it new life, give it new imaginary, so that human rights are able to um, inspire a different future. 
which actually the right of the city is doing, using human rights. So that was my exciting link to that. But I think the, the idea of currency, um, and I think the currency of an image might, um, might have more currency, as in achieving more, not in money, but in, in real effect that you want, um, when it's linked to a campaign. And it's great to hear that Cape Town, I mean, you guys are here, and you, you have been using those images. And so maybe it's a, it's a, it's a call to us here in Gauteng to, to start using these images in campaigns as well. Yeah, that works. Uh, thank you all for your comments because um, some of those are really interesting and I, uh, but I don't want to take up too much time. Uh, the Global North, so my hometown is Seattle, which is two hours from where you live in Vancouver. And in 2017, November, um, and these photos are on my website and I alluded to some of them, I went to America and went to 10 cities, took aerial images. The output is not as viral not as shocking, it's not as juxtaposition-y. And those photos didn't go anywhere. Well, that's not true. I mean, I, they went into The Guardian, I wrote a nice article for The Guardian, and they published it. That was awesome. But people don't ever share those images, and they don't talk about them. And to some extent, I don't think like they made an impact at all. And my initial in was homelessness. But I transitioned to structural inequality through like interstate highways and easements and historical reasons why some areas are considered ghettos and some areas aren't, that are much more difficult to come across in a drone image, you know? And I know that there's streets in America, like there's one in Kansas City I just found out about, there's one in Richmond, Virginia, there's like a whole bunch of streets that were completely, like through race riots or one reason or another, uh, wiped off the face of the map, like in the 1920s and 30s, and then rebuilt differently. But it's really hard to get context of those sorts of events, which speak inequality, but they don't speak to spatial inequality as much as they do to maybe like racial history, uh, contemporary state of affairs of disenfranchisement in America, like these images do much more viscerally. I haven't cracked the nut yet. And I just, I don't wanna dwell on it, but I do wanna say this project has boundaries. I alluded to it a little bit. And I don't want to step too far outside the boundaries either because I don't want to lose the power that the project has. So if unequal scenes now becomes everything, I think it kind of becomes nothing, do you know what I mean? So I think as an artist also, I need to be clear what my boundaries are and move on and do maybe new projects that focus slightly differently. Maybe they're not drone images, for example. Thank you for your comments. I have never heard anyone say that before about changing that political discourse in Cape Town. I'd love to get you to write that down for me. <laughs> Seen about shame is it an effective agent of change? That is so interesting. I don't know. There was an image two years ago of a dead Syrian boy on a beach who had drowned coming to Greece, if I remember right, my Italy. And I would argue that that image shamed the world into an action. I'm choosing my words really carefully because the Syrian crisis was not changed, and the borders with Southern Europe to some extent have been closed in part because of that image, not open. But it did drive change based on an embarrassment to the establishment. If shame is the same as embarrassment, and I don't know if it is in your context, then I guess I disagree with you. I think shame and embarrassment can drive action. Whether or not this image or my images in general have, I don't know. And I don't know if it drives more action than inspiring hope. I am a, kind of a cynic. I'm like right on the border, but I think I kind of lean towards cynical that hope actually is potentially not the best way to inspire change or to, to force change. But I'm not also a political operative and I don't run campaigns. There's people in this room that do, so I'm not the smartest person in the room on that. I'm happy to debate it. And then the last comment, I can't remember who said it, Oh, it was you, about the vast differences between, for example, rural and urban dynamics. I just don't think, as I mentioned before, it's a drone project. Then. So it might be something different, you know? The power of these images is the proximity, it really is. And also in the aesthetic itself, because I've got about 20 images of that location. The drone's in the exact same spot, the camera's just positioned differently. And there's a marked difference in the power 
power of the image of this one versus the other ones. And I'm happy to show you guys at some point later if you want to find me of my Lightroom, like my photo editing software. You can see, and that's how I edit photos. I kind of let it hit me. And some images hit you way harder than others, and I don't really know how to describe it, but it's true. Is this integration post that question? Is it desirable? Uh, that's uh, so, so, you know, all along, the, well, in later, later part ideas, the planners were thinking about how the post apartheid city would be and were thinking it would really help if the poor lived closer to the rich and integration and so on would happen. And I think, I think, um, I think those things need to be questioned. The fact that the, the actual, um, the actual story of the post-apartheid city has been has been gating means that there's been resistance to that um, integration. The fact that Primrose is not gated is still something worth um, celebrating, I suppose, that, that people from Makawusi can actually walk across the road and get into the streets there and do their domestic work without having to go through security checks and whatever. But uh, yeah, so so to me, the, the whole the whole thing about integration is, I think. At this moment, we need to perhaps re rethink about what it means in planning, what it can achieve, and how how to make it achieve the things it needs to achieve. Always bearing in mind that the bigger problem is the economic inequality. The fact that the spatial inequality is contributing to the economic inequality is, is I think, something we, we all understand. If people have to travel far, they you know half their money gets spent, or more than half their money gets spent on that. If they live close by, that's not the case. But does it really? How much does it really help to live close by? Um, it's an interesting study. I'm now going to take the last round. Can I see hands? Ah. Uh, okay. I'm going to start with you, followed by you. Yourself there. You're ready. Ah. Oh. Make it half a question. Thank <laughs> <laughs> you. Take Johnny at the bit. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't know if it's a question or more of a comment that maybe responses to Tato, Tato from Siri. Um, the the shame um, question. I think I might. I, I it was interesting to hear uh, Maxine's comment and your response to it. But what I what came to mind when I thought about you know, how useful an image like this is, is I'm thinking of the SJC's um, street lighting um, project and in what ways seeing what kind of lighting is in some areas versus others and, and how useful that is. So in, in some ways, you, you could, you could pe people who are wealthier and are shamed deeper into their wealth and uh, d don't act, um, perhaps, I, I mean, government still has the, the decision to decide on whether or not we can spend money on better lighting in particular areas. So I think it's still useful, and even if it's just government officials being shamed um, or feeling embarrassed, um, that's still a useful thing. And I, it's, it's actually encouraging that you say that government response to this has been positive. Hopefully we can see a lot more um, of that. But then I also wanted, um, yeah, I think I'll, I'll leave it at, at that. It, it is in the integration thing, I think, is also something I think about it. I mean, one of the presentations hosted by Cubes, I mean, I forget the gentleman's name, who showed that the highest increasing kinds of um, residences have been gated communities and backyard dwellings. And in, in some ways, that, that is the story of like South Africa, the resistance to integration, right? So when there's the um, Affordable Housing Act, you know, people in Bryanston, there's a hoo-ha about um, the, the character of your neighborhood being threatened now because poorer people would now be able to live in your wealthy area. So I think that's, that's probably more of um, um, the South African story, but I, I would wonder if you'd take this to, you know, develop something like this in the nighttime, take a take a drone image and see, you know, in what ways people are connected, um, and in that way. So depicting perhaps basic services in the same kind of juxtaposition way. <coughs>
requirements. So let's try and keep it very short. Sorry. Please. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, think, I don't know if I'm asking a question and I'm making a comment, but it's also on the question of the shame and situation. Looking at it, looking at this image, I feel like you're more shining a torch on the rich and on the state. And now I'm sitting in a position of a person living on this side, the haves. Are you saying now, should I be triggered to do something to help the people on the other side of the fence? Or should I lower my walls to make them feel part of my wealth, so to speak? You know, should I be sitting there in my in my in my riches, wanting to do something for these these people, or is it more of yes, you giving them hope, and also giving people on the other side the have nots hope, and sort of fueling them to put more pressure on an already incapable state? Are you saying now put more pressure on this state that you've been asking for things to get you to a level where? Like the people on the other side of the road. So. Thank you. Thank you very much, Vanessa. Next, uh, Maredi, uh, a bit short, please. <laughs> so, um, I really like the opinions, and I would like to know um, what are the different interpretations. I mean, a person from an informal settlement giving you this picture would actually say, I oh, want to be that side. But how do you now capture? the positive that are happening in the township or in Kaiser, that are also in trying to um, and capture the, 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 the negative that are happening in, in, in the other, other side of, of, of the world. How do you make sure that that um, balance uh, is kept uh, in a way? Because we're in a state now where I think as planners, in theory, uh, the suburbs, uh, we were always like crushing them down, crushing them down. There's nothing happening. People are just leaving there, going to work. But how do you catch up now in an informal settlement where there's news development around there? How do you make sure that in a picture you capture the positive that are coming uh, from, from there? Yeah. Um, so um, I just ask that gentleman uh, if you had an opportunity. Good evening. My name is John According to the reading of those uh, images, what I see on those photos, they are around Drum Rose, which is around the Jet Park, around the Cleveland, around it. My understanding is to tell the story of about the rich and the poor, how they have to live amongst the boundaries, what that street that she gives them. So the interpretation of it is like, uh, let's join hands together. Although I'm poor, and let's make this world or this location of this town a better town. Whatever is going to happen in the future. But now, when is it going to start? Nobody knows. It's for us as human beings. Not looking at the government only, just to make this settlement a place to belong or to make the development of a new solo life, whatever it is. But it's for us also to get a hand in tree. Because that place is full of rich and wealth, which is also your warehouses around it, a couple of firms around it, a couple of mechanical places around it, so people can get jobs around it, which is closer to you. And which is also much help and building their society which stays there. Thank you very much. Yep. Um, I've got just two Make it very brief, very brief. I just want to pick up uh, how I want to pick up on what Jonathan is saying. It's about mm. how do those unequal scenes create proximity to workers? So if you take basic services like domestic workers, gardeners, etc., how they are feed into that privilege and that in a way creates coexistence and economy. The second question is in terms of security. How does that densification impact on security and how does security understood in those I'm going to now give the opportunity to the presenters just to give your responses to what you can remember. We actually cannot exhaust all the questions. I'll give you about one half minute, 30 seconds. <laughs>
We'll solve all the problems in 30 seconds, don't worry. Um, yeah, look, thanks for your comments. I kind of feel like there's a theme here, which is um, what, was, what was the intention of the projects? Is your intention to make people feel guilty? Is, it, is your intention to make people feel hope? What? To some extent, uh, a great photograph has its own life outside of me as an artist. I've been tying those two things together, but maybe now at the end of the talk we can divest them a little bit. A great photograph, and I hope that that is considered a great photograph, can allow you to read into it what you want to see. And that creates that imaginary that I intended to get people to talk about what it means and what it makes you feel like. It should provoke something. So that's good. I can say, though, that my intention, Jonathan and some other people who spoke, uh, Moradi, um, was never to make people feel guilty. And my political viewpoints is not that all the rich people in South Africa should divest their wealth and give it all to poor people. That's actually not what I believe should happen. I feel like there's enough wealth in this country to raise everyone up to the level on the left-hand side of the image without having to redistribute so that everyone looks like they're living in shacks on the right. This is a very rich, rich country that's been exploited and divest of a lot of natural resources and mismanaged for centuries, not just decades, not just apartheid. And an entire class of people, the vast majority of people who live in this country have been disenfranchised. So this is not gonna happen quickly, but it's incumbent upon the people who are political leaders, some of whom are in this room, I think, to take images like this and inspire hope and inspire change and inspire people to have that imagination to think of a better to, to think of a better world. Well, to think of a better South Africa. I also think it's important to limit your imaginations, otherwise it becomes unrealistic. But South Africa, we can do something about this country. We can do something about this situation. Marie, do you want to say something? Thirty seconds. No, okay. I think it's been a fascinating conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Johnny, for okay. engaging us. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you. We can have a 15 minutes break. 15 minutes break. Can we have a meeting at 4 to 3 and this is the venue. Yes, thank you for the next three great great parts. Exactly half past, yeah? Half past.
opportunities and talk.